All right. OK, I'd like to start by welcoming all of you to tonight's Java Bin online session. It's really great that uh, so many people signed up for it. So I hope we give you a good session tonight. Uh, my name is Mark West, and I'm the leader of the Norwegian Java user group, also known as Java Bin. And we're a bunch of Java enthusiasts based in Norway, all the way up in Northern Europe. And uh, we arrange lots of events around uh, Java. We arrange meetups every month. We have eight meetup groups spread around Norway that arrange meetup groups every month. And we arrange a little conference that some of you may have heard of called JavaZone. Now, COVID has put a stop to many of our physical activities. So we decided to put together something we call Java Bin Online. And this is a series of uh, meetups, Java theme meetups every Tuesday at the same time, six o'clock CEST. And uh, we've gathered a bunch of really, really good speakers for you. Uh, previous weeks, we've had Josh Long, Brian Vermeer, Kevin Henney, and all of those videos are available on this channel if you want to watch them. Uh, tonight, we have a real uh, luminary from the Java space, Edison. But before I introduce him, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what's coming up in Java Bin Online. Uh, next week, we have a session with Robin Moffat, where we're going to be talking about uh, Apache Kafka and KSQL DB. And the week after, we have Martin Mulders, who is going to be speaking about Graal or building a, a DSL with Graal. And we've got loads more talks lined up. So if you want to follow what's going on, you can follow us on Twitter at Java Bin. You can follow our meetup channel, which is meetup.com slash Java Bin. Or you can even visit our website at java.no. So tonight we are streaming the uh, talk over YouTube. So that means that you can't ask Edson questions directly, but what you can do, if you have any questions, write them in the YouTube comment, in the YouTube uh, chat, and I'll make sure that Edson gets those questions for the Q&A at the end. So stick around after the end of the talk for Q&A. If you can't use the YouTube uh, chat functionality for any reason, just post your question on meetup.com page for this particular meetup, and I'll make sure that Edson gets all the questions at the end. So um, are you there, Edson? I am. Hello, welcome to Java Bin Online. It's so cool of you to uh, take part. What what time is it uh, where you are? Uh, right now is uh, three past noon. Three past noon. Whereabouts are you based today? Uh, today I'm based in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is home. Uh, usually I'm traveling around the world, but thanks to COVID-19, I'm glad I'm, I can enjoy more time at home with my family. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. I mean, like over here now, it's like uh, three past six in the afternoon. So it's like, that's the wonders of modern technology, right? Exactly. You guys are probably missing dinner and I'm missing lunch. Yeah, we're both missing lunch. <laughs> so everybody's got low blood sugar. So, okay. With that in mind, I guess we we we, we should just start off straight away. So, um, uh, Edson, if you'd just like to uh, start off and uh, we'll, we'll speak again at the end for the Q&A. No, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Well, hello. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction, for the invitation, too. I'm very glad to be here talking to my Norwegian friends. And I'm sending, sending a virtual hug because, well, these days we can't send a physical hug because of COVID-19. But I hope that soon enough, once we have a vaccine and all of this all over, I'll be able to visit you guys and reach you in person. And later we can enjoy a beer and wine in the, the, the Java Bean or even at Java Zone. If you've never been to Java Zone, I strongly recommend that's an amazing experience in a completely unique setup for a conference. And today we are going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is Quarkus. And today's talk is called Coding That Sparks Joys with Quarkus. And I know how many of you have read about or watched even the, the Netflix series about Maria Kondo, about Sparks Joy. So if you don't get the reference, uh, Maria Kondo basically says there are some things in your life that you should leave behind. Uh, you should just take it. Uh, if it doesn't spark joy with you, you just leave behind and keep the things that spark joy to, with you. And I truly believe that at least in the Java world, the Java space, there's some things that we should be leaving behind, like high memory consumption, like having to wait forever, 30 minutes, 50 minutes for my applications to start up and other stuff that definitely we could be leaving you know, behind now that Java is turning 25, some things should be left in the past. 
so we could start to develop our applications in the new Java world that was born now that we are turning 25. And just, uh, well, Mark already made an introduction, but just in case you want to follow me, my Twitter handle is at Yanaga. I talk a lot about Java, microservices, cloud computing, Kubernetes these days. I'm also a Java champion and a Microsoft MVP as a lot of like my fellow uh, drug leaders from Java me. And I also uh, Brazilian Japanese. My grandparents are all Japanese, but I was born and raised in Brazil. So I'm kind of a mixed setup. And I also happen to be, I was, because now there's another person uh, who is also a Java champion and a Microsoft MVP, but I, at least as Google can tell me, I was uh, the first one to get this uh, both titles, okay? So let's try to get some uh, cartoons first. This one's from SKC, uh, XKC, KCD. And this is one of my favorites because like it resonates a lot with us Java developers. We know that Java developers, are very good in social media because Java developers, they always have an excuse to be slacking in Facebook and Instagramming, Twittering or hanging out on YouTube because your code is always compiling. You're always waiting for something. Like when you just uh, make some changes in your code, you execute a, ma uh, a Maven build, then you have to, to wait for like 10 minutes for your package to be ready. Then you have to deploy to your application server, stop, start uh, again, and wait for it to warm up. Then you issue a request just to realize that you just made a typo and you started over again. So Java developers life is used to be boring. And I don't know, since we're talking about Java turning 25, uh, when I started my career, I had a, it wasn't a, a big project, it was still Java 1.1.7. And when I had to compile something, I was just like Java C on my project. We didn't have like fancy beauties as we have these days. It was, we're still using like Java C or plain old make files. Would type Java C, it would take 30 minutes for my project to compile. And I didn't have IDE, so I would uh, code Java using Notepad on Windows. So we would have to be very careful with what you were typing because our answer would be like, wait for 30 minutes just to realize you missed the same column online like 200. So that's what Java development used to be. We used to have a very like slow feedback loop because we had to wait forever. And these things should be left in the past. So maybe uh, Java developers can, Java development can be more productive because we don't have to wait forever for the things that we have to do these days. So, and when I'm saying that we don't have to wait, it's because with Quarkus, which I intend to show to you, Quarkus, uh, the slogan is supersonic subatomic Java because we intend to be very small and very fast. So you don't have to wait for anything anymore. With Quarkus, it's just a matter of saving and it's automatically there. And actually in our tests, we, uh, we, 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 we compare the development experience with Node.js, for example, Quarkus is even faster than Node.js to reload your application. And if you're thinking that if you're doing an, any kind of uh, uh, magic behind like class loading or class paths or something like that, no, a proxies, no, a Quark, actually Quarkus is so fast that we just restart the server and it's already there. But I don't want to keep just telling you that Quarkus is great or Quarkus is fast. I think the best way for you to show that uh, the things that I'm saying is true is to demo to you. And of course, I hope that after the things that I'm about to sh uh, show you today, you'll be so excited that you just go to the website and start your very first Quarkus project. So that's what we're going to do right now. And if I go here to my browser, your new favorite website on the internet could be quarkus.io and you have a lot of like guides and documentation so you can get started very easily. But my favorite button here is this one, start coding because we want to start coding. And you can see that here that I have a project generator. I can go to my group idea and type something. This is the boring part we, because you know Maven or Gradle, we require this property. So let's try to uh, type a group ID. In my case, it's gonna be con Red Hat developers. An artifact ID, let's type Java Bean. I'm using Maven. Uh, and before anybody asks me, yes, we support Gradle, but I'm a Maven fan, I'm a Maven user. I make bad choices. So now I'm going to generate my application. If you just click the button, we're going to download a zip file with the project, but you can publish your code directly to GitHub. So you can start with a Git repo if that's, if that's your wish. But generate application, download the file, okay. And let's go back here to my terminal. Okay, let me quickly switch here my configuration. 
so I can show you the things even easy, even your easier way. So yes, I want to always show my current application. So I am here in my terminal. Let's unzip that Java bean file that we just created. And now I have a Java bean folder. And second step, let's open my IDE. So I'm going to open my favorite IDE these days, which is Visual Studio Code for Java. Uh, with the Java plugin, of course, and uh, look at that. It already is already showing my example resource, which is a class that was generated with my uh, Java project. So, but for the magic to happen, I have to go back here to my tor uh, to my terminal and magic words, which MVN Quarkus colon dev. Whenever I type this, Quarkus starts in develop mode, which means that right now Quarkus is listening for changes in my application code, and whenever I have a change and issue a new request to my browser, Quarkus is going to automatically restart it and refresh and return the new response from, 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 from the server. So you can see here that for the first time, and just have in mind that I have a lot of things running right now on my machine because I have Zoom for the YouTube streaming. I also have a special uh, streaming device here running on my machine because that's why you're seeing this very nice like feature video. I have my talking head in your right bottom uh, of the image, and you can see the terminal here. Oh, here. I'm sorry, I always mix, mix, uh, mix up the sides here on this mirror screen. So uh, you, a lot of things are running on my machine, but my Quarkus application was was able to start in just 1.4 seconds. And whenever I'm developing uh, developing my Quarkus application without streaming and doing a lot of fancy stuff in my computer. Usually starts in like 200 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds. Today is low, but be 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 aware that that's because we are doing a lot of processing here for this live streaming. Okay, so we can divide this all of this processing time by five, and you should be have have a realistic time of how much Quarks takes to refresh and restart your application. Okay, so the magic's happening already. Let's go back here to my uh, ID. So uh, Quark has already created a, a example resource for me. So if I go back here to my browser and issue a request to localhost 8080, I'll be able to check that yes, my Quarkus application is running, my new cloud native application is ready. And if I go to slash hello, which is the path that was created on the hello resource, you can see that yes, I'm returning hello. Let's try to increase a bit this font size so you can see better, yes. It's returning hello. Let's go back here to re hello resource. And right now it's returning hello. I could say, well, it could return hello, which is uh, hello in Norwegian. I suppose that, I don't know if I spoke that correctly, but I just changed something. I hit save, remember, always hit save, go back to my browser, refresh, and it's automatically there. You can see that the string already changing. And if I go back here to my terminal, you can see the quark is starting 40 uh no uh here a more reasonable measure uh almost and i can see that my face is covering it so oops code uh you won't be able to check that but trust me that it is taking 800 milliseconds, okay? But it's going to improve because the, the more you use Quarkus, the better you get. I'm sorry that you can you have to see my ugly face here in the corner, but I think it gives a more like intimate uh, approach when doing this during the streaming. And I hope you can bear with me in the next uh, one hour, uh, which is the duration of the session. So we can have hello here. What else can we do? And out of box, Quarkus supports, for example, uh, async. Um, Request so. So if you want to use a Jaxar and you want to do do async too, you can also, for example, do well. I can use a completion stage here, and it's going to return a string. And instead of just returning a plain old string, I can say, well, return, complete the future, supply async, and let's say hello. Um, async. Okay. So I can return something that is truly async. I'll go back here, refresh. Oops. And I have an error. And you see this uh, Quarkus has very nice error messages. Uh, in the past, you would have to go to the, to the stack trace. And you know that the meaningful stack trace is like up in the, in the, in the top. And you would have to dig through the logs to know uh, what is happening. But with Quarkus, we inverted in stack trace. You can see exactly the error message here. And it say that in example resource line 17, you missed a semicolon. And actually, if you go back here to your code, you can see that uh, it's not exactly the semicolon. 
but it's a Java compiler. Actually, I have an additional parenthesis. So if I go back here and save and just go back and refresh, yes, I'm ASIC. I even have a typo. I could go back here to my ID and fix it. I'm async and save, go back here, refresh, and it's already there. And Quarkus is taking like almost 500 milliseconds to restart, which we can agree is pretty fast. It's much faster than they have to wait for like two minutes, three minutes, five minutes for application to restart every time you make a change. So that's how fast and how amazing Quarkus can be for development, right? What else can we do? We can also inject some properties. So I could say that uh, let's do a string greeting. And uh, let's say that this is a config property. And the name of the property is going to be, let's, uh, boring greeting. So instead of returning, hello, I'm async, I could say that uh, return the greeting. And instead of returning, hello, yeah, greeting, I'm async. So uh, let's try to go back to my browser, refresh. And right now I have another error, error. And if you read the message here, Quarkus is complaining that, well, you, dis, you define a configuration property, but no configuration proper exists for greeting. How do we fix that? We go back to our ID, we open our application properties file and we decrypt that greeting equals to, let's add some French, bonjour. And if I type it correctly, I go back here to my browser, refresh, and not there. Reading equals to bonjour. Oops, I made a typo. I have an additional E here. Now save the file, refresh, and yes, bonjour, um, async. Okay. And just in case you switch here, just because we're using Java 8 Plus and the micro profile config API, uh, you don't have to, uh, to just use like plain old Java types here for the configuration property. I could use like an optional optional from Java Utu string. And I could say that the greeting could be greeting or else I'm going to say hola because it's Portuguese. And greeting or else, so if I go back here to my browser and refresh, it's saying bonjour because I did provide the property, but let's make the typo again. Let's type an additional E. So now I have a, I have a typo, I don't have the property. I'll go back to my browser, refresh and and nothing. Did I save the file? Greeting or else? Hold on one second. Yes. Okay. Nothing like saving the file uh, to, to get the results in your screen. Uh, hola, amazing. So that's how fast and how easy it is for you to use Quarkus in your application. And you might be asking me, well, Quarkus is only that fast because you're just doing it using a, a super simple static JAXRS endpoint and no enterprise, no enterprise Java application is enterprise enough if you don't add a database. So let's try to do that, okay? Uh, just to show you that I already have something running, let's go back here. I have a MariaDB database running my machine. Let's show the databases for you. I already have a schema, let's drop this Schema, drop database, database, Sparks Joy, because I want to start with a fresh one and to show you that it's empty. So use Sparks Joy, show tables, it's empty. Okay, so how do I configure a database in, uh, into my Quarkus application? So I could use the Maven plugin, but I could also manually edit my POM. But if you're using Visual Studio Code for Java, for example, the easiest way for you is to use the Quarkus plugin. Already have installed, and I'm going to invoke that. So Quarkus add extensions to your current project. So you can have a list of all the amazing extensions that we have in the Quarkus ecosystem. So uh, I'll need probably a JDBC driver. So let's add the MariaDB JDBC driver. I also would probably want to use Hibernate and J JPA. But more than that, I want to show you a new API that was created because of Quarkus, which is called Panache. So let's try to use Panache too. I, mean, uh, I also want to provide some JSON output in my REST endpoints. So let's try to add some REST easy and with JSONB. And I also want to test my endpoints with a very nice um, uh, UI. So I'm going to use OpenAPI to document my endpoints. And if everything is correct, don't worry, we can easily add something later. Uh, I, I'll hit enter. And you can see here in the VS Code terminal, I'm just calling the Maven plugin, which is adding these things to my extension and 
And it's asking, well, you added new dependencies to your project. Do you want to refresh? Yes, always. So yes, now my project already has the new dependencies and it should be good to add the, the database pro properties. How do I configure? The easiest way for you to configure the, your database connections to go directly to application properties, which was just refreshed. Is, am I mistaken? Or I have multiple windows open? Well, let's hope I did everything correctly. So no, don't save. Um, yes, it's still my code. That's weird. Yeah. Something disappeared and my Quark station is not picking up my properties. Let's see if the things are correct. Resources. Okay. Yeah. Since it's a live demo, some, something, sometimes weird things happen. Oh, nice. Now it's picking. Oh yeah. I had to wait because sometimes the VS code extension takes a little time to catch up. That's why it's and it's not here because I'm picking the wrongs. Uh, I'm picking that on the target classes. I made that mistake in the past. So on those save one, I'm going to use the one directly on source main resources. Be aware of this, this possibility. And uh, the ABC driver is going to be SparkJoy. The username also is going to be SparkJoy. And the password, again, SparkJoy. Okay, that's been the original. And this one is very good for demos. The Hibernate OEM database generation equals to update, please. Never do this in production. I have a very nice story how it failed for me in production because we made a commit and forgot to, uh, because we're just developing, it was an update, but we forgot to, uh, to change the property uh, at, uh, in production. And we just had an alter table in production in the middle of the day, it was a very bad day. Okay, so, but we can leave just now because it's just a demo. So leave for update because it's very nice. File we're in. Quarkus will automatically change and update and create the tables for us in, your, in our database on the fly. So we leave it as it is and that's it. So we go back here to my code and we need a test entity. So let's create a new entity. I'm going to type a new entity called developer because yes, we love developers. And I love developers because I'm a developer myself. And uh, at entity, if you had to de declare entity in JPA, would uh, you need the annotation at entity? You would probably have to type a very boring a private long ID, ID, add generated value. Uh, but since we're using Quarkus, we can stop doing that. Uh, and I want to show you a new API called Panache. And the thing that I'm going to show you today Panache supports both repositories and active record style. And what is active record style? Active record style is a persistent pattern where the entity and the persistent methods are mixed with the, the, the same class. So if you ever use the play framework or Ruby on Rails, you can see that in this particular words, the active record pattern is very popular. We in the Java world, we are more used to repositories because it used to be very complicated to create uh, active record patterns in the Java language, but thanks to Panache, now you have this possibility of be cre to create your active record pattern entities very easily, okay? So, and how can I do that? I can simply omit this ID because it's going to be inherited uh, by default uh, in your Panache entity. And in my developer now extends, of course, Panache entity, okay? And now I don't have to type the ID. And now every developer should have some property and every developer should have a name. How do I declare a name? I would probably have to say private string name and generate boring getters and setters. And uh, can we do better than that? Yes. And I know that I'm, what I'm about to say it's very opinionated, but please have in mind that if you're declaring private fields and exposing everything as public getters and setters, you don't have proper encapsulation because you're exposing the internal state of your class. So instead of using this private fields and public getters and setters, why not? Why not? Can't we just convert this field from private to public and leave it as it is? And with Panache, don't worry, what we're doing right now, we're coding like a public field, but we're running like a private property because we know that a lot of the frameworks that we have these days, they still generate the getters and setters because of the Java Beans specification. 
But with Quarkus, you don't have any performance penalty for using this style. You can use private fields and public getting inserts if you want to. But if you want to code this new way as Panache is doing, you can code with public fields and code everything as public, but at build time and not at runtime, so you don't have any performance penalty. At build time, Quarkus is converting everything to private fields and public getters and setters. So your, the behavior won't change at all, but the way that you code, it can change. So, um, so let's try the different way. So I'm calling it like a public field and it should be enough. Let me just remove these two unions and imports here. And yes, we should be good. How do we test this developer entity? Let's create a new resource. Uh, developer resource. So we're going to expose it through a REST interface. And developer resource, uh, yes, I'm going to add this is going to be um, path. It's going to be slash developer. And I'm going to list all of the developers in the database. List developer developers and return. And if I'm using plain old JPA, probably we would have to inject a repository or an entity manager, create a query to retrieve all of my developers. But if you using Panache with the active record pattern, I can just take the, uh, type developer dot list all. And I'm going to retrieve and return all the developers in my database, which you, you would never do this in production because, well, you're going to fetch the entire database into memory. But since it's just a demo, we're going to have very few developers in our database. It's good. Okay, and let's try to add some annotations. It's going to be a get, and it's going to produce some uh, media type. Oops. Media type. Uh, dot JSON. Okay. And I guess that's enough. So if you just save it all the files correctly, I can go back here to my browser and refresh. And yes, localhost hello is still working. And you can see that Quarkus already restarted behind the scenes. I didn't stop start Quarkus yet, not even when I added dependencies to my projects because Quarkus automatically detects that and restarts automatically for you. So you just keep Quarkus running and that's it. So Quarkus is it's still running since the beginning of my presentation. If I go back here to my browser, go to localhost slash developer, it's going to retrieve all of the developers in my database, which is returning me raw empty because I don't have any developers. Let's go back here to my database and show that right now, Show tables is empty, but if I just repeat the commands, Hibernate already created developer table in the Hibernate sequence table. And if I describe the developer, you can see that developer has an ID and has a name. Pretty cool, isn't it? And how do I test if it's my rest in the point is returning correctly all the developers in my database? I could test it by typing some very boring, for example, insert statements. Here are my, my MariaDB CLI, but I believe that the best way for me to test my rest in point is through another rest in point. So let's create an endpoint that creates developers. I'll go back here to my IDE and I'm going to create here a post endpoint. Post is going to produce media type dot json also it's going to consume uh, json and this one's going to public response with new developer is going to receive a developer okay and let me import the classes correctly yes response uh yes it should be good so what do we do here? If I want to persist a developer, uh, first I need to make sure that no matter what I receive from the internet, the ID will be null. And I don't need an entity manager. I don't need a repository again because I'm using the active record pattern. I can just type developer dot persist. And that's it. Now just return this guy, return response dot status. And I'm going to status that uh, create it. And let's return the entity because it's useful for us to check if the developer was persisted correctly. And now view the response. Okay. 
So what I did here, response status created, I persisted the developer and I'm returning it. And how do I test this post endpoint? Probably I wouldn't have to create a very complicated curl command and type that on the CLI. But since we're using Quarkus and we added the open API extension, I can just go back here to my browser and localhost 8080 Swagger UI. Whenever you add the open API extension uh, and you're in running develop mode, you have the Swagger UI uh, enabled for you. So you can see that Swagger is consuming the open API schema that is being published here in this endpoint, open API. So I can see that Quarkus already self-documented the get developer, the post developer, and the get developer endpoints. So the one I'm interested in is the slash developer uh, with a post. You can see here that I have an, an, a schema, an example value for me to try. But the interesting button is this one, try it out. So right now I want to try it out. So let's try to persist developer. So the name, I'm going to persist myself first. Yanaga and execute the bottom. And if everything went well, oops, I have a 500 error. Ah, something went wrong in my application. If I go back here, Quarkus is generating a very nice error message. If you read for the message, you see that, well, Quarkus is complaining. You are trying to persist an object, an entity, but you don't have a transaction. So everything you're doing is in vain. So how do I fix this bug? I just go back here to my code. I add the add transactional annotation. I save the file. I go back here to my Swagger UI and hit execute again. Whenever I hit execute again, I have this thing going back to my server. You can see that now I have the proper uh, return code 201. And yes, Yanaga was persistent. Yes, cool, isn't it? Uh, we should try to add more developers to our test, right? So right now I'm going to add Mark to and execute that. And I'm going to put Raphael and execute that. And we have three developers. I'm going to add Burr, which is my boss, just in case he's seen that, yeah, you know. Uh, so uh, yes, everything OK, 200 on OK. Now we should have enough developers. And how, now we, how do we know that these developers were persisted? Well, just go back to my browser and refresh the slash developer endpoint. I refresh here. And yes, I already have four developers that persisted in my database. And just to make sure, I can go back here to my MariaDB CLI and select star from developer. Yes, I have four developer persistence. Pretty cool, isn't it? Yes, I believe so. So I tested here. And what else can we do? Let's try to add another extension. Suppose that I want to provide more validation, uh, some validation to my REST endpoints. I can go here to Quarkus. Add extension, I can pick the validator, the Hibernate validator extension. I just hit enter. You can see the here, I'm just calling, uh, calling my Maven. Uh, plugin here, Quarkus add extension. I'm giving the name. And yes, it was automatically added to my Palm XML. And I didn't have to restart my Quarkus application. And if I want to validate the input that I'm receiving from my uh, from my API, I just have to go here and add this magic annotation at valid. But if you ever use it like uh, the, uh, the validation specification, the Beam validation specification, you know that uh, you're already familiar with these uh, annotations. So what else? Let's try to add some validation in my developer entity. Suppose now that uh, the name should have a minimum length of three. So if you try to persist anything like which is smaller than three, you will get an error. And how do I test it? I think I saved all the files correctly. I go back here to my Swagger UI and let's try to persist another person. And this time I'm going to add me, which is not big enough and execute. And yes, you can see that I had a 400 bad request, which is the, not, the proper error code if, that you need to return if somebody posted a bad request, for example. And thanks to the tight integration that we have with Quarkus and the extension ecosystem, you can see that I have the, the violations are what? Well, the parameter must be greater than or equal to three at new developer dot developer dot name. And the value you provided was me. You see, clear error messages so you know what's happening behind the scenes. Let's get back to my developer. So let's try to add another property. So developer has a name and every developer this name these days has a, like a favorite framework. 
And since we, this is just JPA, so I could add like some specifications. I could also say the column. Uh, I can type, for example, the column definition. The definition is going to be var sharp 255 and default and everybody's favorite framework is Quarks. So let's get that by default. And I have a typo here. Today it's hard to type, yeah. Uh, default Quarkus, and it should be good. Like, how do I test this? I just go back here to my rest endpoint, refresh. Is Hibern uh, Quarkus is going to update my database on the fly. And yes, now everybody, uh, yeah, Yanaga, Mar, Rafael, and Burr, they all have the new favorite framework, which is Quarkus. And remember that I said that in my code, I could run, uh, I could code like a public field, but run like a private property. If you want to provide your own getters and setters, you can. Suppose you have a new requirement and now on your API, all your developer names should be uppercase. And for you to do that, you just have to go here and provide your own getter. If you provide your own getter and setter, Quarkus will use the ones that you provided or else Quarkus is going to generate the getters and setters automatically for you. But suppose that I have this new requirement, get name, and now the name should be uppercase. I just go back here, create the getter, save the file, go back here to my browser, refresh, and everybody's names is uppercase right now. And go back here to my IDE. Suppose that I have the new re uh, requirement that the favorite framework should be lowercase. I save the file, go back here to my browser, refresh, and I can see that everybody's favorite framework, now it's lowercase. And that's how fast and easy it is for you to use Quarkus. What else can we do? Let's try to um, add more resources here. I want, for example, to use repositories. Yeah, you can see I didn't like this active record style that you did because I'm used to repositories. And actually, I think that it really depends on use case. You have a very simple CRUD application. You only have to persist and retrieve entities, very simple queries. Maybe active record style is good for you. But if you have like a complex business domain model, you have like very complex queries, maybe, and that's my opinion at least, maybe a repository should be better for you. So you can mix in your project like an active record pattern, repository pattern, so, but Panache doesn't judge. You can use both in your projects. So we have a developer already. Let's create a developer repository. So what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to create a new class called developer repository, developer repository .java. I have a class and it's going to be an application scope of bean. And it's going to implement Panache repository. Okay. And it's going to be a of developer. Okay. And uh, since we implemented the Panache repository interface, we already have all the goodies like persist, find, uh, merge methods that we have in the JPA or any standard repository, but we can also create like custom queries. So let's suppose that I want to retrieve public uh, list developer and I want to find all the Brazilians. And I think that all the uh, from all the developers that are persistent, I'm the only Brazilian and in particular, I'm the only Brazilian Japanese. Japanese. So let's try to find only the Brazilian Japanese. How do I return that? Return find, I have here uh, a method, I create, create a query. And if you ever create a JPQL or HQL query, I would have to type, I'll select something from developer D where D dot something equal, blah, blah, and you have the query. But since you're using a Panache repository, I know that it's a repository or for developers. So I don't have to type the from part. It's assuming that if you have a developer repository, it's very likely that you're returning and queuing developers. So I can just say that name equals to Yanaka. OK. And that's it. But I could also use a parameter. Let's use a parameter that is a query because it's better. And I'm going to add Yanaka. OK. And list. So if I did everything correctly, my bean and my query are correct. So let's create, let's create a, a, a change. Let's create a modification here in my get developers. So I'm going to add a new query parameter. It's going to be called Brazil. Okay. And Brazilian is going to be Boolean true. And uh, oops, not true, man. Brazilian. 
and I can do a if if Brazilian. I'm going to use the developer method. And how do I use my repository that I just created? Well, let's inject that. Inject developer repository, developer repository. I'm going to inject and return developer repository dot find the Brazilian Japanese. Okay, so I made the changes. Let's test that. Let's query again. It's returning everybody because I don't have the Brazilian parameter here. But if I add this to my query, Brazilian, because it's true, yes, it's returning only myself. So you can use repositories, you can use the active record, you can mix both in your project, you can create repositories for the ones that have active record. Panache doesn't judge. And if you want to do the old style, yes, you can do the old style too. Both works, okay? So that's a quick demo of what I had to show about Quarkus, but let's try to show some more goodies, some more APIs. And one of the nicest feature about Quarkus that everybody is like interested into is that Quarkus can, can create very small and very fast native images if you're using RawVM. So let's create a new project, okay? Now here I have in my terminal, uh, terminal the first project that we created, we used the Quarkus generator on the code.quarkus.io website. But the other way for you to create a project is the Quarkus Maven plugin. So let's try to do that. So I'm going to do use IO Quarkus, Quarkus Maven plugin. I can specify the version. So right now, currently, and be aware that Quarkus is changing very quickly every week almost, and sometimes more than once a week. So the, the current version as of today is 141 final. And I use create to create my new project. Okay. So it's going to ask me for some properties. First, the group ID is going to be con red hat developers. I'm going to create a new artifact, which is going to be a remote microservice, remote. And generate a rest endpoint. Yes, please. And okay, it generated my project and it's here in this folder called remote. I'm going to back here to remote. And I don't know how many of you ever used GraalVM before, but GraalVM allows you to, uh, if you're using native image generation, it allows you to get your Java project and compile that to a native executable image, which means that it's going to create a binary that can be executed natively in Mac OS and Linux or in Windows, for example. And right now, since I'm running on a Mac, it's going to generate a Mac, Mac native image. But with Quarkus, if you want to generate a container with a native image created for Linux, we have tools for that too, which should, should be very easy. Actually, they are very easy. And But if you want to create a native image, and if you ever use a GraalVM, you know that it can be kind of complicated because you have to type a lot of different configuration parameters. So it's a very error prone and, and sometimes it takes a lot of time. But luckily for us, Quarkus optimized all of that and took all the burden from creating a native image from us. We can just type these magic words, MVN package, and enable the native profile. So the magic will happen behind the scenes so we don't have to do anything else. So I'm going to type here. And usually on my machine, it takes approximately 40, 50 seconds to generate a native image of this clean project. But since we're doing this streaming, you have a lot of things going on at the same time, it might take longer. So why Quark is running? Let me show you some more information. Okay, let's show you some numbers because it's very interesting. We have a dedicated performance team that is measuring the memory and time to first request. So let, let's see how Quarkus behaves well regarding memory consumption and time to first successful request. So regarding memory and we're calculating resident set size, not heap size because heap size is a part of the memory that the JVM consumes. So the right amount to compute is the resident set size which is the total amount of your process in your system. So uh, later I'll show you how much is consuming at least on my machine. So if we'll make some comparisons here, you can see that the for memory, uh, a traditional REST application with just like REST endpoints. So if you use Quarkus plus native using RawVM, it's going to consume approximately 12 megabytes of uh, resident set size. If you're using Quarkus through OpenJDK, it's going to consume 73 megabytes of RAM. And your traditional cloud native stack is going to consume at least 136 megabytes of RAM. So the, depending on your use case, Quarkus can be 10 times smaller or can be two times smaller, it really depends. So with Quarkus, I'd like to say that you only have two options. You can be super small and super fast, 
or even smaller and faster because Quarkus is always going to be smaller and faster than any traditional cloud native uh, uh, framework there is there. Okay, but this is for the resident set size for just uh, rest endpoints. Let's try to add some database to the equation. So if you add JPA to the equation, you can see that Quarkus plus native image is going to consume 20, 28 megabytes of resident set size memory. A Quarkus with OpenGDK is going to consume 145 megabytes of RAM. And your traditional cloud native stack is going to consume at least 209 megabytes of resident set size. So again, Quarkus is much smaller than the alternatives. And when you compare like the total amount of memory that is consumed in production. And why is memory comparison so important these days? Because uh, regarding your cloud computing costs, it's very likely that one of your most expensive, if not the most expensive cost regarding the cloud, your cloud computing cost is memory because CPU you can share over time, disk is very cheap, network you can share over time, but memory, if your resident set size like one gigabyte of RAM and you have like two gigabytes of RAM in your server, you can scale up to two instances at most. So you can't share memory over time. Uh, you might have some techniques, but most of the times uh, memory consolidation is very hard to achieve. That's why uh, a very important measure is how much throughput you can achieve with memory. And you can see that Quarkus, uh, you have the same benefits of the runtime performance of JVM when using Quarkus. If you're running, for example, on top of OpenGDK, but you can see that Quarkus always consumed less memory. Let's get some numbers about boot and first response time. And when we're measuring that, we don't measure startup time because uh, startup time is measuring only startup time is cheating because I could, for example, declare everything as lazy. So just to show you a very small number on the console, oh, we started in one second, but then it takes another five seconds for you to initialize all the things, wire all the things and reply successfully to the first request. And well, it's just time you have to wait. And think about that. If you intend to use Java for like scaling up and scaling down scenarios, or if you want to use Java for several scenarios, uh, time to first successful response is very important because if you want to scale up, you have 1 million requests coming, you can't wait for like five minutes for application to start, warm up and serve the first request. It needs to be super fast. So measuring that time, the time to first response in milliseconds, is super important for application if you intend to live in this new cloud native world where requests are coming uh, up and down all the time. And if you want to save costs while you don't have requests coming, like you can run one instance, but you have a burst, you want to spin up for 100 instances. Well, it's very important for you to be fast and, and re regarding time to first response. Okay, so let's get some numbers. Quarkus, if you use Quarkus with native, just rest. Quarkus is going to take 16 milliseconds for the first successful response. Quarkus with, with OpenGDK is going to take like 900 milliseconds for the success, first successful response. And your traditional cloud native stack is going to take at least 4.3 seconds. Remember, it's not startup time because startup measuring only startup time is almost cheating. The important measure is how, how long does it take for your application to respond successfully to the first request, okay? And let's add some JPA to the equation, some database. So if you use Quarkus plus native, it's going to take 42 milliseconds. If using Quarkus with, uh, through OpenGDK, it's going to take you two seconds to respond. And your traditional cloud native stack is going to take so long that I have to scroll the image. It's going to take at least 9.5 seconds, okay? So that's how fast and how small Quarkus can be compared to traditional cloud native stacks in the Java space. So depending on your scenario, Quarkus can be 10 times faster or Quarkus can be five times faster or Quarkus can be 100 times faster, okay? So it really depends on what do you want to do and how much memory do you want to save? And if you're saying that it's not important for you to save um, uh, memory. We have a very nice blog post from uh, the customers that are running uh, Quarkus in production. I think it's Vodafone. Vodafone uh, switched uh, their microservices from another technology, another Java technology to Quarkus. And they were able to save 30% on their cloud computing costs just because they're, they can run the same thing using instances with less memory. So I, I don't know. If you have like a hundred thousand dollar bill per month and you can save thirty percent, I would say that is a very nice saving. But it really depends on your use case. Okay, I'm not judging. I'm just saying that it's a possibility. 
And why we did that, you can see that I go back here to my terminal. And whoa, man, this time it took a lot of time to uh, for my native uh, image to be built, almost two minutes. So it's more than twice the time if I weren't streaming live this, uh, this session for you. So, but let's see if this thing is working. So build success, I can go to my target folder. If I just list what was generated, you can see that here I have this runner, which is an executable image. So let's run this guy. Runner, uh, my father asking me if yes, I want to work and it's running on port 8080. Let's go back here to my browser, localhost. Yes, my new cloud native application is running and slash hello. Yes, it's returning hello. So yes, it's running and how much memory is it consuming? Luckily, I already have a script here to consume resident. PS, SRSS, wrap runner. So I can see that on my machine, at least, my Quarkus application compiled with raw VM to a native image is consuming 22 megabytes of total resident set size for returning this rest endpoint for me. And did you ever wonder the way, the day the day in which your Java application would only consume 22 megabytes of resident set size? Well, me neither, but thanks to Quarkus and other amazing technologies, for example, GraalVM, it is possible today. So we don't have to, well, we can give up. Uh, this jokes doesn't spark joy anymore, like having to wait for application to compile, have to waiting for your Java application to restart, or Java consuming a lot of memory. Yes, if anybody makes that joke with you, uh, you just laugh at them back and you say, well, with Quarkus, all of this is in the past. Okay, so that's what I did. And if you want to, you, if you're just wondering why is Quarkus so fast with this, I have more data for you. Well, Quarkus is so fast when running your application because Quarkus does everything ahead of time. And think about that. Every time you start your application, you always have to do, perform the same steps, which are uh, your application needs to scan for the metadata. For example, you need to scan for annotations. If your application, uh, you have the possibility of using XML files, you have to scan for XML files, you have to scan for uh, YAML files, you have to scan for properties files. You have to do all of this scanning because these things might change. Well, actually they don't change once you package your application. Or you, once you found those files, you have to parse the descriptors, you have to extract the metadata for your, for your annotations, you have to extract the metadata for your properties files, you have to do all of that, then you have to generate the meta model, you say, oh, I have this being, this being is another being which needs to be injected in the other being, but this being has a transaction notation, so I need to create a transactional proxy, so I proxy this being and I inject the proxy, not the being, you see, all of these complicated things that you need to compute, and then after you did all that, you can start the services. Okay, and what's the difference between Quarkus and any other traditional Java application stack uh, built in the past 25 years is that Quarkus does all of that too, but Quarkus does the scan for annotations or meta metadata, the, the, the descriptor parsing and the meta model generation at build time. And when Quarkus needs to start, Quarkus just start the services. That's why Quarkus is so fast to start your application. And that's why Quarkus doesn't consume a lot of memory. And why is that? Well, because if you have to scan for annotations, you have to load the classes for uh, annotation scanning. If you have to look for XML files, and even though you might never use XML in production, well, if you have to parse XML files, you have to, you're going to load those classes into memory and it's going to take some time and it's going to consume memory. So basically Quarkus is super fast because we don't have to do any of these steps at runtime. We do everything at view time. So the magic behind Quarkus is not exactly in the Quarkus runtime because at runtime, we're just as fast as the traditional JVM because nothing changes. At runtime, Quarkus is the plain old Java that you've been doing in the 25, last 25 years. So the magic behind Quarkus is in the Quarkus Maven plugin in the Quarkus extension mechanism because this allows Quarkus to do all of these steps at view time and generate a very streamlined bytecode using a library called Gizmo. So we only have to read that bytecode and your application is running beautifully and super fast and super small into production, okay? So that's basically the magic. That's what's happening behind Quarkus. That's why Quarkus is capable to be, capable to be so fast and so small. So let's try to add some more Features. So um, uh, let's see what we can demo in five minutes because I don't want to take uh, too much time of, 
of yours. I know it's end of the day, even though it's a Tuesday uh, to be actually with COVID-19, the days doesn't matter anymore. Everything is any day. You have like day, 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 day. You don't have Sunday, Saturday, uh, Monday and Tuesday. So uh, let's see, let's try to do some more things. So right now I want to get my application. Let's uh, stop. No, it's, yeah. Did I stop? No, let's stop this guy. So I'm going to run this application again. Runner, but I'm going to give another port. So this is a ATT port, it's going to be 8081. Okay, and I go back to my browser and let's see if it's running on port 8081. Hello? Yes, it's running, hello. Oh, actually, uh, I could show the fault tolerance API, the circuit breaking and the fallbacks and all of the stuff, but I want to show, I think, I bet that many of you are Spring developers just like me. Uh, I've been using Spring since 1.0 beta 2, so it has been quite some time. And I know that you might be wondering, uh, I've been a Spring developer for the past like 20 years, for example, and I want to reuse my skills. So maybe I'm very familiar with the Spring skills, but I want to try this very amazing Quarkus thing. But how can I, how can, basically is, how can I reuse my skills in this new cloud native world? Well, you're covered too. So let's try to run an example here. I'm going to, I'm back here to my Visual Studio Code IDE. I'm going to open Quarkus add extension. And I'm going to add some very interesting, for example, extensions. For example, I can add Spring uh, Web. Uh, so I want to create a REST controller. And I also want to create a Spring Data Repository. So I want to reuse my skills. So I'm adding, I'm calling the Maven plugin to add these extensions. Yes, it's ready. So what can we do now? Well, let's create here a new file. Let's try to add a uh, Spring. Create a new file. I'm going to create a developer controller. Okay, yes, yeah, it's going to be a class. It can be a REST controller. And the get mapping. Request mapping path is going to be slash spring developer. Okay. So I'm going to public list developer. And I can, I can use, for example, panache list all. And I want just to produce a get mapping. OK. Uh, it should be good enough. Yes. Oh, I did it. I forgot to start my Quarkus in dev mode again. Let's go back here to my Java Bean project and run the magic, MVN Quarkus colon dev. So yes, now it's beautiful. I won't have to restart it again. And if you're wondering, I already explained why Quarkus is so fast, but development mode wasn't something that we planned. It's uh, because, but in the end, after Quarkus was running, the engineering team just realized, well, Quarkus is so fast. Why don't we just listen for the changes? And every time we have a change and receiving a request, we just restart the server. So that's why with Quarkus, development mode is enabled by the fact that Quarkus is so fast. So it wasn't a goal of the project to be to have development mode. But since we are so fast and so small, well, why not have development mode too? That's some of the goodies for being like fast and small. So go back here to my browser. My Spring endpoint should be running. So if I go localhost 8080, Spring dash developer. And yes, it's running, it's working beautifully. So it's using my panache methods too, but I want to create a Spring repository, a Spring data repository. So I'm going to do Spring developer repository.java. Okay, and it's going to be an interface. So, and I'm going to extend JPA repository and it's going to be a developer ID is long, okay? And I can create custom methods too. Uh, it's just spring data. So public list developer find by name, string name, okay? So if you use it to spring data, which is one of my favorite spring APIs, Yes, I just created Spring repository and I can go back here and inject this guy. I can now use auto wired and say Spring developer repository, developer repository. Uh, 
and a request parameter. Uh, it's going to be Brazilian, Boolean, Brazilian. If Brazilian return developer repository, find by name, it's going to be Yanaga. Okay, so yes, now I have a Spring Data Repository. Just before anybody asks me, yes, we support constructor injection, but I'm just lazy. So developers will find my name. I think it's good. So let's go back to my browser and refresh. Yes, it's still working. And if I add this parameter Brazilian equals to true, yes, it's returning. Yes, it's working. So you can use your favorite Spring APIs on top of Quarkus. You can reuse the existing mess muscle memory, your coding skills on top of Quarkus, and it will be beautiful. And another common question, oh, does it mean that you're running Spring on top of Quarkus? We are not running Spring on top of Quarkus, unfortunately, because we wouldn't benefit from running that, okay? Because to be super fast to super small, uh, the, the framework, the library that you're running on top of Quarkus needs to be optimized for Quarkus. That's what enables Quarkus to do everything at build time and be super small and super fast. So uh, if you're using Spring, we would just have the traditional Spring memory consumption and speed. We wouldn't benefit from running that. So what we're using is, if you think about this metadata here, these annotations, metadata, uh, me uh, annotations is just a source of metadata. So what we're using is that we're getting this metadata, fetching that, and running it the Quarkus way. So we're not using Spring at runtime. We're using the Spring metadata provided this is Spring annotations on top of the Quarkus runtime. That's what's happening. That's what allows uh, the Spring APIs to be super fast and super small if you're running on top of Quarkus. Okay. So, and uh, another way for you to think about Quarkus is Quarkus is not a framework by itself. Quarkus is a framework for running other frameworks and libraries in a super fast and super small way. So for example, for most of the time, what I'm using, persistence. I'm not running Quarkus, I'm running Hibernate. For uh, uh, REST, I'm not running Quarkus, I'm running REST easy. Or if I want to be truly reactive with a super fast like web layer, I'm, run, I'm running Vertex. Uh, so Quarkus is a framework for running other frameworks. And since the very first layer, Quarkus had a lot of different uh, frameworks and extensions and libraries that were available to Quarkus. And, um, and for Quarkus to be able to optimize your framework, you need to create what we call an extension, okay? And in the very first release, we had a lot of different extensions. We had Camel, we had Vertex, we had OpenShift Kubernetes microprofile, we had Kafka, we have Jaeger, we have Hibernate. And after the first release, a lot of people from the community stepped up and contributed a lot of extensions. So uh, we already have a lot of extensions available in the Quarkus ecosystem. We have like a lot of extensions being developed. People are adding that every week. But if you have your favorite, favorite framework and library and you didn't see that in the Quarkus extension repository, you can contribute to your own extension library to the Quarkus ecosystem. And I'm pretty sure that the Quarkus community will be very glad to accept that. Another common question is that, can I run anything on top of Quarkus? If you're running on top of JVM, yes, Quarkus accepts anything. The difference is that the, the part that has the extension will be super fast and super small. If you add another library that does not have an extension for Quarkus, that particular part is going to consume more memory and it's going to be slower, okay? Uh, but if you want to produce a native image using Quarkus, the answer is that if you're using everything provided by extensions, yes, you'll be able to create a native image without pain. If not, it depends, okay? Uh, you can use the uh, frameworks and libraries that are not that doesn't have extensions. You might be able to compile them to native with some work, or you might not. It really depends on a case-by-case -case basis, but the Quarkus guarantee is that if you use an extension, you will be able to generate a native image, right? So, these are some things that I wanted to share with you with Quarkus. And as I was talking to Mark and Raphael before, I could be talking about three, four hours about all of the features and greatness of, of Quarkus. 
but I know that you're tired. I know that for you right now it's like 7 p.m. in Norway or in any part of uh, uh, Europe in the, within the same time zone that you might be listening. I know that it's always dinner time and I know that you're tired after an entire day of work and how hard it's for you to keep attention to a video, especially when you have this Japanese talking to you and showing some code. Because the Quarkus part is great, I might be boring, but that's why I would like to give you a huge uh, hug, a huge thank you for, if you stayed so long with me, thank you very much because I know that time these days, it's really hard to, to spend so much time into something. And if you're still here with me, Again, a huge thank you very much. And I know we, I think we have some time for questions. So let me go back here to my Zoom. Mark, do we have any questions? Yes, yes, we do. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you for a very interesting talk. It's always good to see a master do live coding. It's uh, a lot harder than lot I harder think than people realize it is. But um, just uh, the questions that I have then, the first question I have is from Jon Fjallstad. And he asks, does Quarkus support Kotlin types, for example, nullable types, etc.? Yeah, I'm not, well, I'm not a Kotlin developer, so I'm not aware of the features. I know that you can use Kotlin with Quarkus. But I don't know if you can use all of the features uh, from the from the Kotlin language or other goodies. So my best bet would be you could try. And if something doesn't work, if you could report to us, we have a very active community who would, we would, like, would love to try to help us. Brilliant, thank you. And then another question, I think this was uh, when you were doing one of your demos and it comes from Jens Goldhammer. And he asks, uh, what about testing the, the REST API? Does something exist like mock MVC for Spring, or should I just use something like REST Assured? I'm not sure that was exactly uh, Quarkus focused, but like, anyway. Uh, well, I didn't have time to show, but uh, we have the Quarkus testing framework because, you know, the traditional way for you to test Java applications was your opinion, but it's super heavy, super slow, I know. So with Quarkus, we created a new testing framework, so the Quarkus testing framework, and it's uh, integrated with JUnit 5 and REST Assured. So the way that we do for, to test your REST endpoints is to create uh, integration tests. So you just annotate with at Quarkus test, uh, which will automatically be an integration test. And it's because Quarkus is so fast, and the more you run your Quarkus, the more the faster will you get. So in, for every test, we just start in Quarkus, you just issue the request and for the other test, we just restart that. It's going to take some milliseconds. So we could provide some mocking and I know there is some value in providing mocking. So uh, we have some uh, a team working on that. But right now for, for uh, the recommended uh, approach as of today is to create uh, an integration testing using Quarkus testing and rest assured. Great. Thank you. And then the final question was around about the usual question we get about slides and code. Uh, is you know is, is, is are your slides and code available somewhere for people to look at and play around with? Uh, yes, the slides are available on my speaker deck. Actually, I can send to to Mark and Rafael, uh, to, so it can be published somewhere. So you have the link to the slide, to the slides. Yeah, we can publish it for on the, the, code, the comments can... of the meetup. Okay. And for the code, I can publish it on GitHub people for you and I can share with you, but uh, I usually don't publish this GitHub code that often because Quarkus is changing so fast because next week is going to be outdated. Uh, but I can share it anyway. My recommendation is that uh, if you could just take one thing from this session is go to code.quarkus.io uh, or Quarkus.io and generate your projects. Here, generate your project and try it for yourself. Because whenever I saw Quarkus, yeah, the slides, boring, 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 boring. And I fell in love with Quarkus the time that I typed NVN Quarkus call on that because development mode is something that's really resonates in my heart. Not having to wait for anything, instant feedback loops. That's amazing. And another, uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, for development, the feedback loop we measured, we even faster than Node.js. And at runtime, um, most of the numbers, we're very close to Go. We are like as, as small and as fast as Go. And actually, now that we're talking about new features, last week when we released Quarkus 1.4, 
uh, Quarkus now has a command mode. So I know that a lot of Java developers in the past five years switched to Go because of uh, startup time and um, memory constraints. And now that we have Quarkus with command mode, I believe that a lot of developers that are developing tooling with Go, they might be productive using Java and using Quarkus to produce these toolings, the CLIs, for example, because now Quarkus supports that and it's working great. Fantastic. OK, well, uh, thank you very much. I'm just going to check just to make sure there's no more questions come on the YouTube chat. No, I don't have any questions, but I do have a couple of comments from people saying thank you. That was a great talk. So it's always good to, to get that feedback, especially when you can't see the audience. So um, mm -hmm. I'd just like to uh, wrap everything up. And uh, thank you, uh, Edson, for coming and speaking to uh, Java Bin online this evening. I've really enjoyed it, and I think our attendees have as well. Um, and uh, Edson's, you can see Edson's uh, Twitter handle down there at the bottom of the screen. So give him a follow on Twitter. And he often comes to uh, to Norway to speak. Uh, so like maybe you'll get to see him in, in person after COVID's finished. Let's hope that. And uh, yeah, I'd just like to thank all the attendees. Thank you, Edson. Thank you all the people uh, in Java Bin that have made this possible this evening. And uh, just like to say good night. Thank you very much. <laughs>